Good evening and welcome to the Ed North Recovery Curriculum Teach Me. So the end of the year is upon us and that would normally mean the chance to relax, prepare for a holiday and put the thoughts of September out of our minds for a few weeks. But as we know, normal this year is not what it was last year, thanks to the ongoing crisis and the ever-changing situation that the pandemic has brought to our doors. And it's because of this uncertainty that we at Schools North East have organised tonight's event, giving you access to some fantastic speakers and resources to try and help you put plans in place as you move forward, ready for the next academic year. For those of you who are logging in tonight who haven't come across Ed North before, we are a programme powered by Schools North East. And it's one that aims to inspire change in all of the classrooms across the North East by promoting an educational culture led by informed debate research, collaboration and excellence. You can find out more information on our website at www.ednorth.uk as well as information on our partnership with Shine Trust where we are helping schools to develop context specific projects aimed at driving out disadvantage across the North East. Website links will be in the chat box below as we go through the evening. Before we get to our speakers, I've got a little bit of housekeeping just to make you aware of. Any technical questions, please send them through the Q&A tab and Sam will help try and help you with any problems that we've got. Any speaker questions um, for today's speakers, also send through the Q&A tab. In here, you can see all of the questions from everyone. You can also like the questions and the most favoured ones will go to the top of the list. And if we've got a chance at the end of each presentation, we will ask those to the speakers. Please feel free to use the chat box throughout the webinar. In here you can say hello and introduce yourself and also share your thoughts and comments. If you're joining us on Twitter we also have the hashtag EdNorthTeachMeet um, and our handle is at EdNorthUK so please do share your thoughts with us on Twitter as we go. And finally if you're on our online community connected, you can also use this as a platform to discuss and collaborate with each other about this evening's Teach Me and event. If you aren't a member and want further information, then the link is in the chat also. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this evening's first speaker, which is Carl Elliott. And he's going to be looking at a trauma-informed environment and recovery. Originally starting life as a bricklayer, Carl now has 16 years experience in education, working with a wide range of age groups and abilities. He has recently achieved a Master's in Arts in Education, focusing on special educational needs and disabilities and inclusion, with a strong focus on the mental health and well-being of children in education, with further training around professional, um, doc, sorry, <laughs> with further training and a professional doctorate being pursued. He has led Trinity Academy Newcastle Multi Academy Trust parenting agenda for the past three years, supporting both staff and students with their mental health and well-being. Through a trauma-informed approach, he aims to increase TAMNAT's nurturing approach through the use of recovery practices and an understanding of neuroscience. Okay, so that's enough for me. I'll hand you over to Carl. Thanks very much, Carl. Thank you, Colin. Hello, everyone. Um, hope everyone's okay. Um, like I said, um, what I'm going to go through this afternoon is I went into it on a, a trauma-informed approach to actually help mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, first of all, just a little bit of insight into exactly what Trinity is all about. Um, sorry, just go back. Trinity Academy, Academy Trust um, has a vision around striving for excellence in everything we do. 
We aim to change lives daily and in an environment which is the trauma-informed environment where kindness, honesty and calm are revered. And we have a, a tagline of preparing the parents of the future. We do this through our parenting ethos. Um, our ethos cultivates a, a feeling of safety, creating an environment where cooperation and where education creates opportunities for relationships by installing principles and boundaries in our young people. Uh, we value growth and we try to develop confidence and self efficacy in our students. So, first of all, what are we going to expect from returning back full time in education? And I think the truth is that nobody really knows. Um, the experiences out there that I've been made to know about from our young people, um, it's not about the experiences, it's about the experiences that they how to affect their emotions, how to affect our young people. So these experiences, they may have had a very bad time during this COVID-19 crisis, but they might have been supported fantastically by the, the peers, by the family, by the, the care, everybody. And they may not have a great deal of effect from the COVID-19 situation. But on the flip side, certain situations, even though they might not seem huge, might have affected some of our young people quite dramatically. So all we can do is try to really estimate what we're going to see when we get back. Now, from the research which I've done for the Trust, what we expect to see, and I hate the word expect, but what we expect to see from this pandemic is these range of behaviours in our young people. Um, sleep disturbance, especially because of the changed kind of what's cardiac rhythm. Um, all of the eating happens and the lower mood and energy levels. These are basically the effects of a trauma which may have been supported, but our young people may still be struggling with. Um, heightened levels of anxiety, either passed on through their caregivers and parents and carers, or from seeing too much news on the TV, which is either fake news or this bombardment that these young people have had around about the dangers out there. Um, and actual pain, that their bodies might have been reacting in a way where the, the body's reacting to the trauma that they're going through. The feelings of helplessness, irritability, anger and resentment, and the emotions may become internalised, so actually they may become more quiet and their normal behavioural state might have totally changed. A young person who was very outgoing might now be very kind of withdrawn and so on and so forth. And cognitive delay, difficulty in focusing and making decisions, is going to be massive for education. At this cognitive delay, if we throw these young people back straight to education, they may not be able to process the information the way that they did previously hence not be able to move forward as fast as they want to. And they may have clear, unfrag clear fragmented memories when discussing the events of the, the COVID-19 situation. But we may be seeing some more, more serious kind of experiences of trauma. Um, we experience certain parts of the trauma, certain experiences that they've had, which have been quite detrimental to their well-being. Intrusive thoughts and flashbacks surges of emotions related to the events. So a, a comment might be made which can trigger a very, very strong surge of a negative or even sometimes, you know, a positive emotion. Sometimes it could be on both sides. Um, avoidant and disassociative behaviours associated with the events. We may see that young people who become quite erratic, quite irritable, quite quick to anger, but also on the other side of that, the dissociative behaviours, they may be acting very withdrawn and actually not responsive to anything. Unable to remember past events and the relationships especially might be changed. Some young people with attachment difficulties might have had a secure attachment during this COVID-19 situation and they may have really got on with the caregivers and really built them attachments and not want to leave that and not want to come back to education. On the other side, there might be young people who have had a secure attachment with people at school and they have gone into a situation where they're no longer getting that secure attachment and then they have now an insecure attachment and that might have changed. Low self-esteem and guilt feelings, especially if they have survivor guilt. It might be the case that they are feeling guilty for going through such a bad time and they haven't. Symptoms of bereavement. All the perceptions of the world, including times, values and expectations. This has been a whole upheaval for our young people and their whole perception of the world might have shifted that we really need to address. Again, hyperarousal and overreacting, sudden signs of anxiety, insomnia relating to the sleep again, but different rhythm that the body's in, and morbid obsessions about self-harm and death.
I'm going to go through a couple of things about the trauma-informed approach that we use to try to estimate what our people have gone through. Um, and the link here, I'm going to send over the actual website as well, but if you can access the hyperlink, there's a hyperlink here which um, you can use, and this website comes up when you move over it. State-dependent function is something which has been termed by Bruce Perry, um, massive in neuroscience, and he has developed something called the neurosequential model of the brain. In the brain he looks at it, it actually works from the bottom up. And the bottom is the, re the reactive kind of fight, flight and freeze situation. You then have the middle part, which is very kind of emotional and sensory, and then the top part, which is logical. And depending on what brain state these young people are in, depends how they function. So if they're in a calm brain state, social engagement is easy. Social engagement in the classroom, they can interact, they can actually work logically through problems, through challenges, it's great. But as soon as they start going down this scale into the alert stage, where maybe ask more questions to reaffirm what they're thinking, in the alarm stage, they will get into a state of hyperarousal. That's when they're going to become very emotional, they might become very fidgety, quite angered. They go further down in the fear area, and then go into a dissociated brain state. A dissociated brain state is the case that animals, when they're in, in terror, they play dead. And that's a very similar to what some of our young people that we see, especially in our SMH focused STEM trust. We see a lot of young people that like the state of just closed down and not responsive to anything. But also, this kind of um, brain state as well, also lessen the window of tolerance that these young people can actually take on board. So when they calm, they a big window of tolerance. They may be a bit more challenged, they may take more stress from certain situations. But again, as it goes down the scale, that window increases. And I think it's really important to remember that staff undertake this as well. This is not just the students that are facing this crisis. Staff have gone through quite a difficult time and they've faced the crisis as well. So another, again, a link through the... Uh, this is about toxic stress. The strength that young people have faced during this COVID-19 situation, they may have had moderate stress, which has been supported by a caregiver and a key person, or they might have had prolonged or even toxic stress. Now, if the stress is predictable and it's been supported, social engagement, logical thinking, and emotional regulation is quite easy. But if this stress has been toxic and it's been extremed over a prolonged period of time, it creates an oversensitivity to cortisol, which means that tiny little stresses, which may not have affected them in the past, might make them then go straight into a said state of hyperarousal or even a disordered state. So things that before they did and they could cope with fine, they might not be able to cope with now. So how will a trauma-informed environment help? And again, if you want to know more about trauma-informed environment, Dan Hughes in the PACE model is, um, is excellent. Um, just wait for this to nip back. So Dan Hughes has developed the PACE model around a safe, structured psychological environment. Um, Given routine, a lot of young people have missed the routine. They haven't had a strict morning schedule, dinner, tea time. We need to get that routine back, including seating arrangements, a timetable. Give them something so they don't have to worry about what's happening next. Establish the firm boundaries. Be firm but fair. Yes, allow flexibility, but try and have so there's no sudden changes to give young people a bit more structure and a bit more ownership that things are going to be happening and that they don't need to worry about what's going on next. Clear for responses to challenging behaviour. Do not approach the behaviour as, you know, something they've done wrong. Again, it's a voice. Clear for responses, challenging behaviour, and really help remove, you know, that experience and facilitate the core regulation. Respond to the interactions in a thoughtful, measured manner. Be very careful to be mindful of your own kind of emotional state when you respond to the interactions in the trauma-informed environment, because you can use your own judgments and your own bias sometimes, and it's a case of looking at exactly what is going on, and then use acceptance of why they're, why they're feeling that way. Young people are entitled to feel angry, upset, and sad in certain times. The behavior you can challenge, but if you accept the, the students feeling a certain emotion, that will straight away will break some barriers down and help them to break through what's really going on. 
again, respond to the child's emotional age, you know, including traits and interactions, but also look at the child and understand what their developmental age is rather than their physical age. And um, predictability to ensure you are seen as being safe and secure at all times. Young people, especially now, need a key person to go to as a safe base. And we, as staff, need to really make sure that we are this person who's predictable and actually is going to react the same way each time, no matter what the young person's done. And name the need. I use a process with a lot of the people in the trust using the five whys. Asking why five times and really dig deep into what the issue is to find out the core problem. And again, distinguish between nonsense and genuine kind of questions and expressions. A lot of these young people might be used in certain emotional states to hide their actual real emotion, to hide what's going on. Try to really underpick and pick out what's really going on with these young people. So, open the lines for, for uh, managers, open the lines of communication. Find areas of additional support, so really make sure the staff are supported, making sure that they can communicate well, they can really, really make sure that they've got someone to go to if they've got any concerns. And clear guidance around what staff expectations are going to be. Be honest with yourself, if you can't cope, seek help, you know. Make self-care an essential part of your day. Recognise your triggers. You know, recognise what's going to set you off and making sure that you log them and be careful if they come up so you can walk away from the situation. And help others only when you're available to help them. And supporting students, behaviour is a voice. It's one of my, my biggest sayings that I use throughout the trust. Behaviour means something, it's an underlying need, it's something that these children are trying to express or they need something off you, okay? Reconnect before you correct. Reconnect with the young people, establish a rapport, and then we can start to move them forward and connect what, what's going wrong. Explore what effects their experiences had on their well-being, especially their ability to self-regulate. It's not the experience, it's the effect it's had. Rhythmic somatic movements, get them moving. Get the rhythmic movement so it engages with the brainstem so they can start to really break down and get out of that fight, fight and freeze state of mind. Make self-care an essential part of your day. And it's so important that actually leave everything at the door. Make sure you do some self-care and you, you don't take all this pressure and stress away with you. And the other ones, again, recognise and help others when you're able to do so. And lastly, I want to leave you with dig deeper into the why. Really explore what the why is and what's really going on with these young people. Okay. Is there any questions? So I, I've got a question, Carl. I was just wondering. Yes, Colin. So you've gone off. Hi Colin, it's Sam, you're just muted there. There we go, it's technology. Eh? I was asking, can you hear me now, Carl? Yes, I can, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was just asking, what do you think the, the number one tip would be for teachers over the summer to prepare themselves for kind of like the first week back? What, what would you kind of suggest? Our, we've done a lot of training around emotional intelligence recently, um, and we've done it through the six second approach. I would say the best thing is to take time for themselves over the, the summer holidays, really, really appreciate themselves and get their, that self care done. Um, but go in with an open mind, go in with an open mind to these skills, and whatever behaviors you see, see them behaviors as what they are. Not that all of a sudden this young person's all of a sudden got naughty over these, and I hate the word naughty. But yeah. it's got this way, look at what's happened and dig a little bit deeper. But I would also make sure they've got a support package as well and make sure they've got somewhere to get all these things out, have supervision time with someone. So we'll pair that over the summer. Yeah, perfect. 
I'm sure we'll get loads more questions as the night goes on. And what we'll do is we'll post them into Connected. So if you get a chance um, over the next you know, few days, if you can just pop in there and answer any of those that kind of jump up, if that's okay with yourself. Certainly, I will do. Hi, Colin. It's Sam. Sorry to interrupt. There is one question just in the chat there that I thought we would just try and ask. So it's what is somatic movement? Yeah, of course. Somatic is engaging with the emotions and moving the body. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's research out there by Peter Levine, I think it is, called Somatic Experiencing. Very, very excellent kind of um, to look into. And I'll put, I'll put another link um, for that as well. And it's about the rhythmic part of that sort of somatic stuff works in with the bottom part of the brainstem. The bottom part of the brainstem is what is uh, connected with fight, flight and freeze. So if you've got a young person in crisis who's not responsive, who's disassociated, those rhythmic kind of interactions and movement and kind of even rolling a ball towards them or bouncing a ball can really get them out of that kind of emergency state into one where they're into the second part of the brainstem and they can start regularly with emotions and then start thinking logically about the situation. So somatic very much is engaging with the emotions. One thing is that young people being sat, I hate to, you know, particularly being sat either in front of the TV, in a games console, and they're a bit closed off towards the body. So reconnect them with the body, get them moving. Play musical statues in the classroom as a, as a kind of engaging with the emotions and sounds and the feel of actually moving again to, to rebody them, really. Perfect. Thanks, Carl. Thanks so much. Um, Thanks, like I said, we'll drop the rest of the questions into um, Connected over the next few days and we'll kind of reconnect and kind of go from there with, with that. No problem. Thanks very much. Perfect. Cheers. Thanks very much. Okay, so the next person that we have for you this evening is Will Rusco, and he's going to be presenting on a, an approach taken to reflect and give hope to returning students using structured conversations. Will began his career in education as a geography teacher at the Stonehenge School in Amesbury. During his time at the school, he, be, he became head of geography and progress leader for years 10 and 11. In 2010, Will moved to the John Bentley School in Calm, where he was head of year until being appointed assistant head teacher. And he joined Melksham Oak as vice principal in September 2019. So I'm just going to pass you over to Will now. You, can you hear me, Will? Yeah, hi, hi, Colin, thank you. Let me just bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Colin, and thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. I think one of the few positives of this time is uh, the accessibility of CPD online and the fact that I can talk to you tonight from down south uh, is great and I think it's, it will change CPD for, for um, the future. Um, Melkshire Oak, uh, we're in Wiltshire, uh, we've got 1200 students, 11 to 18, a rural school and like Colin said I took over um, as vice principal in September of this year and it's been a very interesting first year as vice principal. Um, I just wanted to take you back to the 1980s to start with and uh, talk about these two gentlemen. This is Seb Coe and Steve Avett, and I saw this um, story when they were talking about uh, how Man City were going to come back after Liverpool had won the league. Uh, both of these gentlemen were incredibly competitive, both from the UK, uh, long distance runners. And on Christmas Day, Seb Coe sat down and he said, right, I am going to have a break. I'm going to have a day off running. I'm not going to train. And he sat there on Christmas Day and then he got thinking, what if Steve is out doing some running? What if he's out on a run? I'll fall behind. I won't be as competitive as him. And he ended up going for a run. And um, a few weeks later, Steve Avett um, heard about this and said, what, he only went out for one day, uh, one run on that day? The reason I talk about that analogy is sometimes we can get a little bit obsessed with what other schools are doing. Um, and this, this uh, scenario, this crisis is new to everyone. And we are all learning. And I think sometimes we can worry or we can see something on Twitter and think, oh, we should be doing that. We should be thinking about doing this. There was something on Twitter recently. It was saying how many um, uh, year 10s are engaging with the work that you're setting at home. And people on Twitter are straight away going, oh, 80 percent, 90 percent. And then other people panicking, saying, oh, my, mine's nowhere near as that. And oh, we should be doing that or we should be doing this. Ultimately, you can only do what you think is right for your kids. 
and what's right for your context. I'm going to take you through how we approach the return of year 10. It might work for you for when the kids come back in September. It might not. It's just some ideas that you might be able to take. But all you can do in this situation is concentrate on your kids, you know them best, and what you think will work for them. So when it was announced that year 10 were gonna come back at the start of term six, as a geographer, I went straight back to uh, the Maslow um, hierarchy of needs. And Carl's um, picked up on some of the stuff we're talking about. And I, I'll come, um, I won't go through all of it because Carl's mentioned a lot of it already, but this is where we started from. So we looked at the bottom first and it was clear in the work that we were doing with our vulnerable students that sleep was a massive issue. And it will be an issue in September that uh, kids were completely out of the cycle. They're becoming nocturnal because they were you know, on their Xboxes till late in the night and then sleeping through the day. So we knew we would have an issue with them returning to school and getting back into the cycle of being up for a half eight start. I shouldn't say all kids, some, okay? Um, we then thought about the safety needs and it was clear that um, there would be some students who would be worried about coming into school fear that they would um, catch the virus or fear that they would pass it on to grandparents or other family members. We knew that the students would struggle with the fact they hadn't seen their friends. We, we, you only have to see that when the lockdown started to be lifted, that there were, student, there were the teenagers meeting in parks. They need to see their friendship group. That's so important for them as their group. And they, they need to have that. And they felt the grief of that, having that taken away so quickly. And some might even blame us as a school that we ended them seeing their friends and having those relationships. They will have missed their teachers. They will have missed the routines of school. And then finally, we felt that they will have missed that sense of accomplishment, that sense of you know, getting praise points, getting praise from staff, representing the school team. Um, they'll have not gone to their after, after school clubs, they'll have not gone to their clubs outside of school, playing for rugby team, playing, playing theatre. Um, all of those things where they would have been acknowledged. So we, we knew there would be gaps in their needs. And I think this quote that uh, was on Twitter, it you know, sort of brought it home to me. And I'll just give you a moment to be able to read that. We were very clear that an unhappy child is uh, an unhappy learner. And so when the year 10s came back, we knew it wasn't the right thing to go straight into trying to deliver the curriculum. We we're also very clear that at that time, the national media were talking about the lost generation. They're not the lost generation. We were determined that they were not to feel that they were the lost, determined, uh, lost generation and that we were gonna do everything in our, in our power for them to do even better than anyone else. So that they, there was still hope, but they needed to know about that hope. So we started to plan what it would be like when they came back. So um, the year 10s came back one day a week to start with. And we were lucky that we had lots of staff who wanted to come back in. We used this phrase, achieving success together. And when the kids came in, we talked about what success was. We talked about what they wanted to achieve at the end of year 11. We actually called them year 11. And we met them on the gate and we said, hello and welcome to year 11. And you could see them go, whoa. And they, they actually, their body language, they rose. They thought, wow, we're year 11s now. We talked about success as, yes, GCSE outcomes, what they want to achieve at the end of year 11. We talked about um, what, you know, success being, you know, how the teachers remembered them, the students at the school. Success in, you know, still success on the, the sports field, success in the drama studio, success in the, the art gallery. And we then talked about how achieving was a verb. It was something you had to do. You had to go and get it. And we had to do it together. You worked with your peers, you worked with your, your, your parents, and you talked with, worked with your teachers. We then gave them an opportunity to reflect on their lockdown. So we had an idea how they were feeling. And I've just copied um, all these resources, Rick Colin, and we're, um, I'm happy to share them with you. Um, these are some of the um, responses. And it was really clear that we were right in what we were thinking, that the kids had, had, had struggled. Most of them all said of one concern they had from uh, lockdown. Um, I particularly like the one about uh, it, was, it was better when mum stopped nagging. But you can see that some of those students at home were really struggling with technology. There wasn't enough laptops at home. There was, you know, one family was sharing uh, a phone between the four of them. One phone, that's all the technology they had. 
And yeah, like a lot of schools, we had a lot of our curriculum going out on the internet. So we, we realized that they were struggling and that they would have feared that they've lost time. One in particular, one lad that I remember, was really talking about how he, he was angry. He was angry with the government because he felt angry with the school to us because he thought the school shut, so I'm not going to achieve anything. So again, we had to put that hope in. We had to give them a clear plan of where they were going to go. So we used the model from the Achievement for All that, uh, so, um, organization that some of you have used with this idea of structured conversations. And because we had enough staff and because the number of students are in school, we could take each individual student out for a structured conversation. Now, the structured conversation started with an explore stage. We just listened to the student. We used the reflective reflection form that they used and we listened to them. We listened to what they were concerned about. And we used this thing called paraphrasing where you show empathy by repeating in a different, slightly different way what they were saying and to just check that that is the main point that they're talking about. After a while, we really then focus, the staff then focus on identifying what the key priorities were, what they felt were the first things that we had to achieve to help you know, put them on the road back to achieving the, that ambition, that key goal of what they wanted to achieve. And then we could see that we could start planning that. We could plan it and say, well, this is what we're gonna do as a school. Lots of them were needing career advice again. Lots of, so we agreed that we would get a career appointment in place. Um, but there were steps that they had to do as well. What did they have to do? What could they do at home when they weren't in school to improve the, the, the home education they were doing, the self-learning that we were doing? And then at the end of the meeting, we reviewed exactly who was gonna do what. So no one was in doubt. The teacher who took the meeting and the student, there was no doubt about what had to be achieved. Um, and just, just, um, just to, to explain, there was training on how to do these structured conversations. So we did a whole staff meeting on Teams uh, so that we could go through this, so everyone was clear on what they had to do. And this is the form that they had to do. So you can see that the, the explore stage, they could talk about um, how school went. We did, our, we did ask the teacher, not sharing it with the student, just to grade how we thought their homework had got, how their work from home had gone. So green, amber, red, just so we could get an overview of the school. So we could use that just to give ourselves an impression of that as a whole beer group, how they had got on at work. And then you had your academic targets and your, your pastoral targets, um, all agreed. Now the key priorities for this is they will be followed up, okay? So this is just the start of using these forms. And, and that shows the student commitment and accountability that we will come back and ask if they've done what they said they were gonna do. But at the same time, the school is doing what we said we would do as well, okay? So um, the conversations went incredibly well. We had members of staff coming to tell us saying, can we do this next week as well? Because we want to spend longer with the students. These are great conversations. This is a brilliant opportunity to have that time that you wouldn't normally have had in the school day to really plan the next 12 months ahead of um, what the students could do. And um, yeah, the staff were saying that they really enjoyed it and they really saw the benefit. And we had really good student voice as well saying that this was the right step to take. So, what are the next steps? We're obviously, as the rest of the country is, preparing for what school looks like in September, but there's lots of what we did uh, with the year 10s that we can do um, with the other years. We've realized that we do actually have to acknowledge what's happened. We have to acknowledge the four months and we have to spend time with the students in tutor groups to do something like the reflection form so they can just review what their lockdown was like. And we can start picking up who's had um, lockdowns that have been tougher than others. Uh, and we obviously know that already because we've done a lot of connections with our vulnerable students. So we have a good idea. We had a meeting this morning and we, we think we've probably got about 70 students who, who need a little bit more care when they come in, so to varying degrees. Um, we also realised how important it was to offer hope. Um, these kids are coming back thinking that they're well behind now. Now they're not going to confess that, they're not going to admit to that, but the fact that we were honest with them meant that they could buy into the fact that, yeah, they're, they're, this, this isn't the end of the world. This is, you know, um, they're, they're not going to have a lost, a lost education just because they missed four months of school. Um, and actually, after we did this, we got back on to teaching the Mass English Science. Uh, we've done remote lessons as well into school for the staff at home. 
because the students had the confidence, they wanted to start doing some learning uh, and they wanted to, to, to get back in the classroom, but we're always checking where they are and what they're doing. So when we come back in September, there will be a holistic program where we, we, we do something similar for all students. But then there'll be some students who need a little bit more focus work, that they might need some group work to just talk about their experiences that they've had. And there will be some students who will need some, some deep recovery. And we, we've got plans in place for that with our welfare team as well. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect, thanks Will. Um, we do have one question if you've got a couple of minutes. I know you're in a rush yeah. uh, to, to, yeah, to get off. Uh, so. <laughs> So I've got a question from Karen Smith, and she wants to know that um, pupils and young people might have suffered significantly as a result of the pandemic, but how yeah. about the positivity aspect and reversing the words and terminology similarly to James Duran's blog? What advice would you offer teachers in this approach? Yeah, I think that's, you know, you know, when I talk about hope, that is what we were talking about, the positives. We did not just reflect on the time and go through how horrendous it was, actually looking forward. So yes, we, we acknowledge what happened in the past, but everything was about what, what they were going to achieve in the future. So that's where that positivity came in. And that's why the structured conversations were very clear on the end goal and what they could achieve, and what they could take from it. And, and of course, we've, we've, we've talked about the positives that we've had from this and, and the assemblies that we did. We did virtual assemblies as well. Um, and there are positives as well. There are some students who've said they've, like, they've really enjoyed spending time with their family and really enjoyed doing things that they would never have done as a family before. Uh, but at the same time, acknowledging that a lot of students haven't had the positives as well. Uh, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we, we, we as a school are always looking at the positives and, and, and the hope again I come back to. Perfect, thanks very much. So you'll be around on our virtual platform towards the end of the week to answer any other questions yeah. as well. And you can, if anyone's got questions for you, you can drop them in there. Um, and the resources have been shared in the chat as well, so we'll get those out to everyone as well. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. If anyone gets get, get in touch with me, uh, more than happy to talk through. Yeah, and just... you're on Twitter as well, aren't you, Will? So I'll share yeah. that out on the Ed North. Yeah, Twitter. brilliant. Yeah, It'd be great to hear from you. Perfect. Thanks very much. All right, cheers, Colin. Bye. Take care. Take care. Excellent. So that's some, you know, two really good sessions there to kick us off for this evening. Um, we've got two more to come for you, two live sessions. The next one is a tag team um, from Nadia Siddiqui and Lindsay Wardle, who are from Durham University. And their um, session is going to be based around summer schools and what is the evidence for this as a catch-up strategy. So Dr. Nadia Siddiqui is an Ednorth ambassador. She's an associate professor at Durham University Ed Evidence Centre for Education. And she's led an evaluation of several popular education programmes. Finding evidence to tackle challenges associated with child poverty is her main area of interest. And today she'll be presenting some interesting lessons learned from an EEF summer school impact evaluation which she conducted with Professor Stephen Gorard. Lindsay is a doctoral researcher at Durham University and coordinator of Durham University Evidence Centre for Education. Her doctoral research is focused on reading attainment in Northeast England and Lindsay also supports the DC in its work promoting the use of evidence in education policy and practice. So we've got everything there for you guys. Um, and actually I'll hand it over to you for the next session. So, shall I start, Lindsay? Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, basically, these are the findings of a summer school uh, program evaluation that was conducted in 2013. Um, this was an EEF funded project led by Professor Stephen Gorar and the colleagues uh, Beng Hatsi and myself uh, were the co-investigators. We evaluated this approach. Uh, worldwide summer schools are very popular and um, there is a lot of evidence on it, but there is no conclusive um, results. So there is no conclusion whether these summer schools work in terms of um, academic outcomes or economic, academic performance of children or not. Um, they are very attractive. Um, attractive interventions for the for a number of reasons not mainly looking at the performance of children whether it improves or you can protect children from dipping uh, in their learning uh, during the summer holiday programs and uh, other than that there is always an aim to overcome hunger and poverty during summer 
uh, and having school clubs during summer school or a short day school, this kind of an intervention has its appeal for uh, schools and for uh, families from disadvantaged groups. So for the first time, I mean, this is the Bell um, Foundation has uh, evaluated summer school, uh, but it wasn't a very good uh, evaluation. It didn't come up. It, they claimed that it was, it was successful and it had um, a good effect on a student's uh, performance in literacy and numeracy uh, for the primary school, but actually it was not really, didn't give us really clear evidence whether it has helped or not. So EF, uh, when since its inception, this was their first program that they run it and we were the evaluators for this program. And uh, in 2020, this has become again quite relevant, um, although we are not living in those times when this intervention was conducted. Uh, we are living in a different world. Uh, summer schools are uh, talked about by the government, by the school leaders and different other organizations with the perspective that we want to overcome the loss in learning due to learning uh, due to COVID-19 crisis. So once again, uh, there is an, uh, there is this intention to roll out this program. However, there are certain um, caveats with this program. No matter it looks very attractive, very appealing, there are issues, and that's what we have learned from this evaluation. And I think these uh, issues will remain relevant. During, uh, during, if, if during the COVID-19 crisis, and uh, this is what we are. Can we go on the next slide, Lindsay? Mm -hmm. This is the report, and uh, this um, the paper has been published. I think it might be against the paywall. So, but the bigger report is available on EEF website. A lot of evidence, a lot of uh, explanation of the design uh, that um, that uh, Stephen developed this in evaluation. Uh, for and uh, it's like basically we were expecting 1000 students to take part in this very very expensive program which was basically structured designed as an intervention by uh, future foundations so there are 43 schools in uh, in the areas across london they took part in it and uh, future foundations um future, future foundation um uh, recruited teachers to take part as mentors as uh, tutors in the program they provided training to them and how they will teach learning what new approach they will uh, they will apply during summer schools so they were given full resources planned resources each day was planned how they will administer teaching and how the day will pass how how each day uh, what they will do and what students will uh, do during that day. So 75 minutes of every four weeks program and each day 75 minutes were given to literacy and numeracy with the purpose that the that they are taught in a way that's more small group teaching, more resources available, more face time available between student and teachers. And in addition, each classroom had mentors and peer mentors that were always there to support teaching process, helping um, teachers to uh, to manage behavior, uh, to, uh, to to take to take care of children. So 75 minutes were structured literacy and numeracy according to the plans. And after that, the school day was all about uh, enrichment activities. So the enrich enrich enrichment activities were a range of provisions and because it was the site of the program was uh, London. So London had a lot of uh, providers that, um, that, that gave that provision of, uh, of after school clubs, cookery club, dance club, swimming, boating, rowing, football, coaching, the whole range of programs that one can imagine that made the summer school. So literacy numeracy was not the main aspect of it. Lit literacy numeracy was an additional aspect. And why we think like that? Because uh, children coming from disadvantaged families, for them, retention and attendance is a problem. And we also found that we wanted 1,000 students to take part in it, but ult ultimately we could only have 435 students because participation in the program is a problem for summer schools. In those times, we had, um, it is not a compulsory school. As we see, if it's not compulsory, um, parents wouldn't, wouldn't come, wouldn't 
would they wouldn't be encouraged to send their children for um, on a regular basis. So summer school was also like that. So we thought we'll get one good response with 1,000 students, but unfortunately we could only have 435 students. And by the end of the program, four week program, we could we had only 300 and three students for whom we matched the results. And so that's not just the case for this, pro this particular program that Nadia and, and the team assessed either. It's been the case with other studies as well. So um, an example would be Discover uh, uh, Summer School, which Carol Torgerson um, has done a, a, an AEF study for as well. Very similar findings where there was a struggle to recruit pupils and a, a struggle with attendance. And um, that's a key concern in, ter in terms of if we're going to bring pupils into summer schools and in terms of cost effectiveness is this the best way of going about it um, or are we better in playing a long game um, and looking at other options um, all the time in particular with this one as well um, it, you look at the the effect size for math which was zero so mm -hmm. um, is this actually the best way to go about it as well Hi Lindsay, it's just Sam here. Um, just to yep. let you know that we can only see that first slide that you have. We can't see the rest of your presentation. Oh, I don't know why that is. So I think it's, it's just the front, um, it's a slide, yeah. it's a front page of the paper. We mostly what we are telling is, is available in the paper yeah. and then you can see. And if anybody wants a link to the papers, I'll put our e email addresses at the end uh, into the chat box and we can provide those papers for you if you need yeah. a copy of them. So at the moment, we can just see kind of the back end of your presentation. So that kind of title slide, just to let you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So the second program that we want to talk about is uh, the enrichment activity programs, basically tied in with the same aspect that it's learning, structured learning after school clubs and uh, having, having and seeing it's measuring its impact on literacy and numeracy outcomes. So this was based, the whole program was based in schools of, of the north, northeast, northwest, and the pro providers are, are called Children's University. So what basically they pro do is, um, is, is, is help schools to build, build small communities or after school clubs and uh, do, to help students and their parents in, in doing activities towards participation and civic participation, social work, and um, more focused on social emotional learning, but with, with an end outcome of improvement in literacy and numeracy. So these after school club, clubs we found, um, this is one of the promising approach, um, approaches in EF toolkit and we have found a positive outcome. So the reason we are talking about these two is that summer schools under the current scenario will, the main pitch of these summer schools will not be literacy numeracy for parents. The main pitch will be coming to school with an idea that there are lots of activities happening. There is a lot of uh, summer stuff going on and you will have a lot of opportunities to do things that, that you haven't been doing for a long time. So activities such as outdoor games, swimming, uh, art, cookery. So the schools need to, to do these activities for the reason to increase participation and retain students. So summer is a challenging time to retain students and encourage school uh, parental participation or students engagement. So in whatever circumstances, so specifically under the current, we think that summer schools will struggle more than normal in engagement of uh, parents and engagement of children and regular attendance. And in order to make that successful, there should be a range of activities not looking like a normal school at all um, and making it look like it's full of fun activities uh, that are structured and uh, providing all those opportunities that students have missed during the lockdown, such as outdoor games. Yes, Lindsay. Yeah. Um, really just thinking with this as well, um, over time, uh, the year five um, pupils that this second intervention we're, we're discussing here, um, took part in actually had a bigger effect size than the year six pupils because of it was over time and because they would really embed in this idea of fun activities and it be it would be much more embedded 
perhaps. And um, really that just highlights that short term fixes aren't really going to be the answer at this point. Really, we need to be thinking about the long term. Um, another issue perhaps with this as well is thinking about teachers um, coming in during their school holidays when you're all at the end of a long year, which has been incredibly difficult in, in it is at the best of times, never mind um, at the moment. Um, and, you know, it, under those 1,265 hours uh, that teachers are um, directed for, um, what, what, where should teachers be directed? Is this, it, what is the best use of that time? So some of these activities perhaps might be best suited to scout leaders or to other professionals coming in and offering these fun activities and it, it, giving teachers a break really when they need it before September. Hmm, agree. And Future Foundations, uh, school, uh, the summer school, the per pupil cost was around about £3,000 because of the enrichment activities. And they hired two groups of teachers. So for um, each group uh, had two weeks of teaching. So after that, there was a transition for another group. So the reason was that it will save money for the project and then as, at the same time teachers will have their own um, holiday time period taken off if it is done in two groups but that really didn't work because that transition didn't fit very well with children um, for two weeks they got time to get settled with a teacher who was new never taught them before and a new syllabus new way of um, of teaching and after two weeks she's gone and another teacher comes in that wasn't really successful but this is how they we learn from from the evaluation that this this kind of trans transition doesn't work um, I think teachers' well-being matter in, in the current times and uh, support for teachers should be available if schools are opting for summer school as their catch-up learning um, strategy that then uh, teachers' well-being teachers well is as much important as student well-being. Um, however, that's like the pupil premium is again more important now than it was before because these programs are expensive and um, I think uh, with the challenges we have in the Northeast, I think we need more spending on such activities and resources. With Future Foundation, uh, what they did in London, they hired uh, schools that had large spaces, uh, bigger buildings, and uh, they asked students to come in those schools so that they can do regular activities such as football, dance, and swimming club and everything in, in, in those uh, venues um, and that really worked very well. Uh, it was a new environment for students and there were students going into secondary school after the summer. So that kind of an, a new environment gave them a chance to look at a school bu building which looks like a secondary school. So that was uh, fed back to us that that was helpful for a smooth transition. Um, as pa some parents said that some of the activities that were offered during summer were, were, were only a dream for their children, a special football coaching uh, and uh, swimming and, and dance from professional uh, coaches. That uh, couldn't have been possible. And some parents also said that um, we can't, exp uh, can't, uh, can't afford going on expensive holidays. So this was the only thing that we could provide to our children. And that was really very helpful. And the government should support summer schools. But um, there was not really much attention, much a drive for parents to, to do, okay, my child will have smooth transition from primary to secondary, or they will gain literacy and numeracy more, or there will not be a summer learning dip. And I think parents wouldn't see those um, aims of summer school. It's only teachers who would be concerned about that. So that's it. A really final point is just thinking about a lot of the activities we've been that are precisely the kind of activities children of all uh, backgrounds will have missed out on and in particular perhaps the disadvantaged pupils um, due to the fact that we have lockdown and you know swimming pools and museums etc have all been closed so um, children haven't been exposed to these activities and some of those that can be done outside perhaps um, are particularly important at the moment for health reasons. 
um, because of the virus. So they uh, are definitely things that uh, we can be looking at um, as a, a way of getting children back to socialising and back into the, the swing of things. Mm. And they can, th these activities can be, can be done in bubbles, outdoor activities, um, if they are properly structured and well supported with resources and uh, proper staff, they can be conducted in, in bubbles. Thanks, Nadia. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, we could probably talk about this for another hour, I guess, in, yeah. <laughs> in terms of other things that we can kind of, um, you know, communicate there. What we'll do is we'll put all of the resources and everything that you've got into Connected and on, into the Ed North um, page on there. And again, if, you, if anyone's got any questions, we'll drop those in over the course of the next week or so for them to be answered, um, if that's okay with yourselves. Yeah. yeah, that's not a problem. And I'll pop our email addresses into the chat box if anybody wants to get in touch with us by email instead, we're more than happy to answer any questions as well. Perfect, and I've shared your Twitter links as well on, um, on, on Twitter, so anyone can get in touch with you on there as well. So thanks very much, guys. Um, we're gonna move on to our last um, presenter now of the evening, last but not. I can't hear. Oh, Thank you. Thanks, Colin, I think you might be on mute there. No doubt you're saying really nice things about me. Thank you. Dear, there we go. I'll tell you what, just keeps flicking on and off. Um, yes, yeah, so I was introducing you, Sean. <laughs> so I'll go back a little, a couple of steps. So we've got Sean Harris, who is the North Area Director for the Ambition Institute. He's a former assistant and deputy head teacher, and he is supporting the development of school leaders and teachers to lead an impact in challenging school contexts. He's completed a master's research with the University of Warwick and is about to start a PhD doctorate with the University of Teesside. Um, as a vice chair of governors, I, he gets the support of Primary Learning Trust in the northeast of England and also is a chair of governors for an all-through school in Northumberland. So I'm guessing it's going from Doc Harris to Doc Brown as we go to Sean's presentation. And um, that was a really bad joke, Sean, so I'm just going to leave you to it now. Thanks, Colin. That's brilliant. Um, I'm hoping someone will shout if they can't see my slides. And similarly, uh, I appreciate everyone is super busy and super tired at the end of term. So uh, I'm not looking to, to take a huge amount of time. Rather, uh, this is a discussion starter this evening. Um, and I've put lots of links uh, and other uh, sort of helpful suggestions in the slides, which you'll get after the meeting tonight uh, to look at in your own time. So big disclaimer from me right at the start of this, I am a film buff, uh, I love sci-fi, I write, I research, I tweet, and so there are lots of very tenuous links to Back to the Future um, in my slides this evening, but you'll be pleased to know that it is rooted in research-informed approaches to practice as well. Uh, what I would say is if you haven't seen the Back to the Future films, this is clearly going to be littered with spoilers, so you may want to just um, uh, log out now if you really have haven't seen them and we're planning on doing the box set uh, binge uh, this weekend. But really the ultimate aim that I'm trying to do tonight is look at how do we re-engage our teaching and learning flux capacitor? How do we really go back in September to that stuff that we know will have the most credible gains and is rooted in the most credible of research? So let's just for a moment just, just think about this no more than 30 seconds we've heard a few things tonight that, that'll help us with this no doubt uh, if you've got a notebook and, and paper um, by all means uh, do this do this by yourself but just a moment just to think about what do you think are the key teaching and learning challenges that you're going to encounter in classrooms in September no more than 30 seconds Great. So I've been giving some uh, thinking to this myself as well. Uh, I can see a few people have, have popped things there in the chat box as well. Um, and to be fair, these will be specific to your to your own environment as well. 
But generally speaking, and what some of the initial research has started to show is that clearly there's going to be learning gaps. We know, for example, that six weeks academic holidays equates for some youngsters to have gaps in their learning. We know there is that little bit of a drop off um, come September. Imagine what this is going to look like for some pupils. And I'm trying not to be too doom and gloom about this. But what we know is that that's going to be significant for probably your most vulnerable of youngsters. Similarly, quite a lot of heads in the Northeast have said to me that there's almost this culture of explosion around online uh, CPD. There's loads of blogs, articles, tweets going out about this stuff. We heard about uh, some of them from Will before, and I thought he, he really sort of uh, provided a really useful framework for, for thinking about kind of buffering some of that stuff. But actually, the danger is that come September, we'll have lots of members of staff in lots of different classrooms across lots of different subjects, trying lots of new initiatives. And there's a danger that that isn't joined up. And there's also a danger that some of that is incredible. Similarly, we've all been in schools where year 11 have been pulled out of all subjects to do intensive maths and English and science. Uh, and we know that actually some of the research on that stuff is, is pretty grim. Um, so we know that some schools will no doubt fall into the trap because it's what they know best uh, of just doing lots and lots of catch up. And I'm not knocking that this evening. I'm not having a dig at that. But what I'm saying is that could, if we're not careful, create a culture in which the bread and butter stuff that we do in classrooms doesn't get given the leverage it needs. And so finally, um, I've also seen lots of articles recently, I've seen lots of, of sort of commentary around how lessons need to be really engaging, that you know, children are gonna be really badly behaved because they've not had routine and structure for the last few months. And whilst I'm sure that is true in some cases, there is a danger that just focusing on what looks like fun and engaging and creative teaching is done at the expense of those teaching methods that we know leverage the best learning. So I guess what I'm saying is let's not just try and make things fun. Let's root this in research. My gamble then, if you like, is there's never been a time, probably more than, more than this current climate that you guys are all serving in, for there to be um, informed approaches to teaching and learning. What we really need is to go back to basics and say, okay, so what does good teaching look like? And let's just forget about the Ofsted framework for a moment. What do we know is good in the classroom? What helps learners learn? So what we're gonna do is take a very whistle stop, 88 miles per hour, another cheesy tenuous link there, a voyage of each area of focus or strategy. I'll give you no more than a minute or so to digest it. Then we'll do a quick quiz. But honestly, the real power of these slides will be you taking them back and using them with your colleagues or by all means pinching my CPD session uh, and doing it for yourself. More than happy for you to do that. I should have said at the start, it is based on an article that's just gone live today in SecEd. Uh, and very much we at SecEd are happy for you to use uh, all of the content of that article as well. So focus area one, you've got to come back with me, says Doc, if you've seen the film. One of the things that, that we know from research is that evidence shows that pupils need to encounter new concepts or content um, at least two or three occasions before it actually sticks. Similarly, Rosenshine uh, talks about how the most effective teachers in the studies of classroom instruction understood the value of practice. And actually, he talks about the fact that these teachers uh, would get really sort of expert at, at developing sort of five to eight minute review of curriculum or content that had been previously covered before they moved on to new stuff. So come September, what I'm suggesting this looks like for yourselves in schools is this, asking pupils to highlight points that they've struggled with during COVID, if they can remember that far back, uh, reviewing concepts or skills that you've practiced uh, as part of those, those virtual learning sessions that you've you know, uh, so tidily put together, but similarly, review the material that you think needs to be overlearned. We know from research that there's, uh, there's a real need to take those concepts and really think about how do I practice this over and over and over again? And then how do I go granular with those core concepts into such a way that my children will understand it? Um, I appreciate we've all got pressures of curriculums and schemes of work to work through, but I think this stuff is really key as well, particularly for new teachers that you might be mentoring in September. Focus two, you built a time machine out of a DeLorean, says Marty. 
hinge questions, uh, if I can just talk about hinge questions for a moment. So hinge questions are those questions that are used to inform uh, the next steps of learning, to recap on uh, what has been taught, to really test pupil understanding as well. And I think there's, there's kind of loads of examples online of, of kind of great questions that, that you can use. Um, but we're really thinking about how you use those, those questions at hinge points in the learning process. So for example, um, Dylan William uh, says, you know, hinge questions are, are critical. And he says, it should take no longer than two minutes and ideally less than one minute for all students to respond to these questions here. And, and what he's saying is the idea is that hinge, the, 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 sorry, the hinge point question is a quick understanding rather than a new piece of work in itself. So don't overthink it, but build this stuff into your planning. When will you ask these questions? When will you check that pupils have understood it? And actually, when will you ask these questions to work out whether you should be moving on to that new topic or that subtopic in the next lesson? Again, just a few practical examples of what you might do to do these. I'm not gonna focus on, on them all. Um, Roger Purdy, I had the pleasure of talking with uh, recently, who's a senior leader at St. Bede School in Lanchester, and he features in the article, which I'll share with you at the end. And he just made a really valid point to me a couple of weeks ago. He said, there's a danger we go back in September and we just test and we test and we test and we do all these whole school tests to, to really kind of benchmark where children are at. And actually his argument to his new teachers and to his departments is, let's instead build low stakes quizzing into our curriculum areas. So let's just, that, let's just make that the habit of recapping and retrieving uh, the information that's been taught both pre-COVID uh, and also in September as well. Similarly, focus on the key content. What is it that you really need the pupils to know before you move on to new content? Finally, focus three, 1.21 gigawatts, says Doc, as he realizes uh, what the DeLorean needs in order to get Marty back to uh, his uh, future self. Uh, again, a minor spoiler there uh, for those of you that haven't seen the film. Uh, I love William's quote about cognitive load theory. I've come to the conclusion that CLT is the most important thing for teachers to know. A bit like the 1.21 gigawatts of the DeLorean, this is the stuff that you really need to be mindful of in September when we go back into those anxieties that we've talked about this evening, uh, some of the work that, that Will talked us through, some of the, the summer school intervention research we heard about a moment ago, there is a danger that when we go back in September, senior leaders, heads, school leaders, lead practitioners are exposed to too many initiatives. And there is a danger that that will impact what pupils are retaining. So let's just remind ourselves here of the need for good quality teaching that adheres to cognitive load and that that science of learning is built into our planning as well. So for example, uh, Kirshner uh, and others in 2009 talks about the fact that if it's used properly, group learning, for example, can actually spread cognitive processes. But again, a few practical points for you to consider. And you guys know this, you're teachers, but sometimes it's really helpful to be reminded of this. So presenting new information in chunks, uh, really thinking in advance about the exposition that you're gonna use, the analogies, the examples, the illustrations that you're gonna draw on to maybe teach some brand new content in the autumn term. Think about that stuff in advance as part of your planning. So finally, uh, a brief quiz, no more than 30, 40 seconds. How many of these can you get? Uh, five statements there that I have touched on, uh, maybe reflected on or hinted at as part of my presentation. Uh, you've got 30 seconds, which ones are true, which ones are false. I'll put them up, like I say, in 30 seconds time. Uh, nice little start off a 10 to test your department or new teachers coming into the profession come September in your schools as well, if needs be. Great, not gonna spend a huge amount of time on these because I am conscious of time now, but here are your correct answers. You can go through them uh, yourself after this. Like I say, the slides will follow, but again, just a nice bit of summer reading to recap on if any of these have confused you in any way, shape or form. Uh, finally, I just wanna finish on a positive note. At the end of the trilogy, again, massive spoiler alert, uh, it all works out fine. But Doc says this, he says, your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has, your future is whatever you make it to make it a good one. I just want you all to be reminded of the fact that you uh, 
because of you, your pupils don't need a DeLorean. You are in the business of writing futures. Uh, you do this stuff really well. And particularly those of you in region who have had the pleasure of visiting this term, you're doing phenomenal work. Uh, and I think you really deserve some, some time off as well. But well done. Uh, nobody uh, necessarily signed up to a global pandemic when they went into this profession, but you've done a remarkable job of it. Um, again, finally, just some links uh, and other things that you might find useful to share with uh, your teams or just to read through yourself. But a real pleasure sharing with you this evening uh, and enjoy the road ahead. Or again, for a tenuous link, where we're going, we don't need roads. Thanks, Sean. That was brilliant. It really was. Um, again, like with the other speakers, we will um, get all the questions to Sean on connected so if you've got any questions for him please do log on there and post any any kind of information that you want um sean to give you any answers to our help and advice we have got some other sessions as well pre-recorded for people that couldn't be with us here tonight so these will be posted in the ed north group um as, as kind of easter eggs if you like um, and everyone will be able to kind of see those when you log on that's it for us. So I just want to say thank you for joining us tonight at the Ed North Recovery Curriculum Teach Me. Thank you to all of our speakers, to Carl, Will, Nadia, Lindsay and Sean. All the resources and information can be found on Connected. And if you have any questions for the panellists, they can be posted on there as well. Please do join us in late August for our next Teach Me session. Uh, more information on that will be forthcoming over the next few weeks. And finally, if you are interested in developing a project, with Ed North and Shine. We have a very, very short video coming up next to give you a bit more information. That's all from me. Thanks very much for joining. Do speak to us on Twitter and join us on Connected. Take care, guys. <laughs>